going through schooling and everything and now at work when you're working with kids they're always talking about like you can't assume what different things mean just because someone's swearing at you all the time they not might not be angry there's all Aww. sorts of different reasons for it if you're going to teach something you can't just say it or just show it you have to use like many different ways to make sure that everyone's included and that's awesome but I feel like someone's always getting forgotten and that's people who fold their arms. <laughs> There's also, we still always teach never fold your arms. Yeah. That makes you look like an asshole. Yeah. You can do all sorts of other things and we're being very accepting of all sort of different neurodivergences, but if you fold your arms, you're a dick. Yeah. And what I'm, if my I'm, arms are just heavy? I'm standing up for us arm <laughs> folders. Good. I never fold my arms and I'm very aware of it because it makes my shoulders feel so much better. Mm -hmm. I have really bad messed up shoulders. Yeah. I just want to fold them all day long. Yeah. But I can't. You can. I'm going to start me. just folding my arms all day. It's going to be great. That's why I love museums. That's yeah. one of the many reasons. But I can uh, walk around with my arms folded and nobody questions you. Because no. you can look at a painting or a sculpture or an artifact with your arms folded. And then you look like you're studious. Mm -hmm. I love doing that traveling around. I just put my headphones on. I wouldn't talk to anyone. I just fold my arms. And, and you're like, hmm, painting. Interesting. Oh, man. I want to just do the whole podcast with my arms folded like this. Do it. Does it feel so good? It's very nice. It puts my shoulders where they should be. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like a more neutral position yeah. with no pulling. So everyone out there, go start folding your arms and people will be like, oh, what's wrong? And you're like, nothing, asshole. Why are you <laughs> judging me just because I fold my arms? You don't know me. I don't want to talk about it. Yeah. Just show you don't know me at them. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be pretty great. That's what you should all do out there. Yeah, everyone. All right, well, let's get started and welcome everyone to another episode of I Love This, You Should Too. My name is Indy Folded Arms Randawa, <laughs> and with me is Samantha All Smiles Randawa. That's me. Are you all smiles? Right now, yeah. Good. Not always, though. Sometimes it's just not the time. That's true. Sometimes it is just not the time. <laughs> Funerals. Can you fold your arms at a funeral? No, because then you look angry, yeah. not sympathetic. Yeah. See, know. even in your time of mourning, you can't fold arms. No. You can cry, you can pass out, you can do whatever. You fold your arms, you're a dick. What a jerk. Well, we are members of the Alberta Podcast Network, which is locally grown and community supported. And this week, we have a special sci-fi week. Yeah. We decided instead of doing a whole new theme, uh, we'd just kind of piggyback off of our Megan episode from last week. Yeah, so maybe some of those themes will come back later on. But we will each have a spoiler-free sci-fi thing of the fortnight. <laughs> yeah. And then I'll let you know what we are going to watch for the big watch. But if you listen to last episode, you know it's going to be one of a couple of things. Mm -hmm. Because we had some fun with AI and killer robots and scary dancing. Yeah. And some other things. <laughs> so we're going to use that as a jumping off point. But before we get into everything, let's thank our first sponsor of the episode and that is park power in alberta you get to choose who you buy your internet electricity and natural gas from if you choose park power you are choosing a positive local business and park power shares its profits with local not-for-profits that are working to make a difference for their communities shopping local is very important to park power and we love local here at the alberta podcast network so it's a great fit to learn more go to parkpower.ca so, Indy, we've already told everyone that we're doing a sci-fi thing of the week. What is your thing of the fortnight that is also sci-fi related? <laughs> <laughs> well, my sci-fi thing of the fortnight is Star Trek Ooh. Deep Space Nine. So I talked of quite a while ago, I think it was about Star Trek Voyager, uh -huh. and I've been kind of watching through the Star Treks. And just like I talked about before, I think it's odd that you're either like a Star Trek person mm -hmm. or you've never seen them. Right. Very few people are like me who I was just watching. I was watching Always Sunny in Philadelphia. I was watching ER. And my third show that I was kind of bouncing back with, and forth with was Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Just a casual Star Trek watcher. Yeah. yeah. I don't think I feel like people should be allowed to be casual. Mm -hmm. Just like when we were talking about sci-fi in general, you're saying like, oh, I don't really watch sci-fi, but I like this and this and this. And then I said like, well, those are all sci-fi movies. Yeah. I guess I didn't really understand what sci-fi was to begin with. Maybe. And I think that's like with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I think something like a Star Trek show, if you're not already into shows like that, 
you'll think that you're just not going to be into it. Mm -hmm. So from someone like me who is a casual Mm -hmm. Star Trek (laughs) fan who just watches things here and there, this is why I think you should watch Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Mm. I think it might be my favorite Star Trek. Oh. I'm not sure. I do think it has the highest peak. Okay. The best two seasons of Deep Space Nine, I think, are the best of Star Trek in general. Oh, okay. I, maybe other shows have a higher average. I'm not sure because I'll have to continue my, <laughs> uh, my watch and my journey. But I really enjoyed this one. And right now, if you are in, I think, the US or Canada, at least, you can watch it all on Netflix. So that's awesome. Mm-hmm. And there are 176 episodes Ooh. going from 93 to 99. And it is set in the 24th century. And if you don't know anything about Star Trek, it's kind of like uh, Earth is part of a United Federation of Planets. It's kind of a UN situation where mm-hmm. they're not explicitly military they want to just be about exploration but you know what sometimes they get pulled into the military stuff so i like the premise of this show because it is about an alien planet Mm -hmm. and all of these plot points work great if you're just talking about a country as well but i feel like as soon as it's extrapolated out into space people are going to be like no it's not for me but if you substitute alien with just a country of your choosing it becomes suddenly more interesting to a lot of those people so you can just do that so it uh takes place around an alien planet and these people the the bajorans have been occupied for many years by an invading force called the cardassians and they are stronger militarily and they have invaded many other planets and conquered them and the people are subjugated and essentially like enslaved or at least working under these occupying forces now when the show starts there have been peace treaties and there have been accords reached and the occupation is ending so there's this big space station that's outside of the planet orbiting it that was where the occupiers always were but now the occupation has ended they're going back to their home world and the un essentially the humans mm-hmm. the united federation of planets comes and they're just going to oversee things and stay in that space station and a lot of times there's worries about this because the people who are coming to the space station are like are we the new occupiers this mm-hmm. is like a weird situation that we're in we're this provisional kind of government But then they're just trying to prop up the Bajorans to do their own stuff. Like, you set up your own provisional government. But, of course, there's warring factions on Bajor because there's this power vacuum. Because they've been living under, essentially, Nazi occupying forces this whole time. So now that they have the power back, there is a big power struggle going there. And sometimes they go to these outside forces, the humans, and they're looking for some sort of direction. But then other people are like, why are we bringing the humans in? We just got rid of some aliens that were taking over. Now we're bringing in new ones. And that's a really understandable thing as well. And then you hear from the old occupiers and they're always talking about like, look how much better you had it under us. (laughs) You should be thanking us for civilizing you people. And it's just very clear that that could easily be interpreted to so many historical things that have already happened on Earth. That classic argument of, we just helped you. (laughs) Yeah. And like, we would have gotten here without your help. You set us back. You just tried to make us in your own image. And you think that is better, but it is not. Mm -hmm. And to many outsiders, maybe that does look like progress, but it wasn't progress on their own term. Right. Interesting Mm. stuff. So that's what gets me into it because you're starting out with a very good premise. And then there's also like terrorist organizations coming from the planet. And they're like more minor villains on their show. But you get some insight to them and they have had their homes taken away from them. They've gone through all of these giant wars and now they're fighting back and they're doing it on their own terms. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of have some like empathy for them (laughs) as well. Meanwhile, the the kind of hero of this show uh, does commit some light war crimes as oh, well. Oh, just some light war crimes. And then that leaves us to, to deal with, well, he is the hero of this show. But then again, are we on board with this? It's for the greater good, but at what cost? And then the show deals with religion a lot because the people on the planet uh, are very, very religious. But then some other people go like, oh, those people you believe are gods? Those are just different aliens. And then everyone's like, well, what's what's the difference? Are they powerful? Do We can still believe in them. 
and we start talking about like what religion is, what the nature of God even is, and uh, that gets into some really interesting places. But then meanwhile, on the space station, sometimes you just have an episode where like all the aliens working at this bar, they just try to unionize. Oh. And then we just have an episode about trying to unionize That's a bar. fun. I like that. There's a lot of pro-union stuff hmm. in it. Like, um, I think I've said to you, and you probably have no idea about the context, but we watched something with Cole Meany, who plays Chief O'Brien, and on a different show. And I always talk, say the line about, um, like, oh, was your father a hero? And his response was like, no, no, he was much better. He was a union man. <laughs> <laughs> and I love that. But then when there is war, and war does break out on this show, it's not just all about spaceships shooting each other. Sometimes we see when the war is happening, we go down to those shop owners, and we see them like boarding up their shops and thinking like, oh, this again, like I've lost so much from all of these wars. We go down to the teachers and their schools are being closed and they have no idea what to do for their children because they can't help them like they used to. Mm -hmm. We go down to the civilians and the fear that they have of this impending war or they're watching TVs and hearing that these peace treaties that they have been working under are coming to an end. And there's like a palpable fear or fear about that. too. Oh. This seems very like real to life. It is. And I think people dismiss shows because there's like spaceships or aliens, right. but it's not going to be good unless you make it real to life. Mm -hmm. And I think the creators of this show definitely know their their history and it shows in this. Yeah, because these are like real human problems that yeah. happen on a day to day basis. And then there's something that sounds so sci fi, but like seems very appropriate mm -hmm. to us of the last few years because there's this race of shapeshifters. And then they can look like any person and they start infiltrating Earth. So then high level people are getting uh, blood tested to make sure that they are, in fact, who they say they are. And they're not shape shifting. But then all of the people in on Earth are like, what? This is encroaching on my freedoms. Mm. Like, mm. why? Why should I have to go undergo this slight inconvenience? But you're like, well, you could save the entire planet. That's yeah. why we're doing it. And they're like, no, fuck you. My freedom. And watching that episode, I was like, ooh, that's a little, that's a little, a little close nose. to home. Yeah. <laughs> but that this show doesn't paint either side as the bad person. They're like, well, yeah, they've lived under this kind of utopian earth for a long time. And then to have your utopia taken away from you mm -hmm. and you have to start worrying about things like people in these less developed countries or in this case planets have to worry about all the time. Mm -hmm. Once you are subjected to the inconveniences of people who are not doing as well to you, it looks like an attack on your freedom. Mm -hmm. It's it's really interesting stuff. And I think uh, Star Trek Deep Space Nine is worth a watch. Sure, you uh, sometimes have gelatinous people who have uh, <laughs> sex for the first time on this show. It gets into weird things like yeah, that because it's a sci-fi show. But then you also have these uh, real true-to-life problems and then sometimes you just have a bunch of Cardassians playing a baseball game on a holodeck. Oh, that sounds fun. Because it does that kind of stuff, too. <laughs> so it's kind of all over. But overall, I think Star Trek Deep Space Nine is a great watch. And some of those best seasons, which are probably about like 75, 80% through the run, I think that's where it peaks. But the other stuff is pretty enjoyable, too. And mm. they do a lot of real fun thematic stuff. So if you're looking for maybe getting into the world of sci-fi, I think this is a good point because you'll realize that just because there are aliens and spaceships mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff doesn't mean it's not telling very human stories. So Star Trek Deep Space Nine, go check it out. Yeah, it sounds fun. So you want to watch that next? <laughs> We've got a lot <laughs> of shows in the queue, so not right now. That's that's a hard no for you out there. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder, like, to get you watching Star Trek, what a good starting point would be. I think this might be it, but I'm not sure. Hmm. We'll see. One day. One day. <laughs> Once we make it through all of ER. Oh, that's a big... We can talk. And a little tiny thing of the Fortnite. ER, pretty good. It holds up. Yeah. I didn't really watch it when it was new because, well, I was, we were children, We I were think. little, yeah. yeah. It was, like, 1993, so I think I was, like, four or five. Yeah, we were a little young for it, but it's pretty good. <laughs> well, Sam, how about you? What is your sci-fi thing of the fortnight? Um, my sci-fi thing of the fortnight is a comedy, drama, sci-fi television series called Upload. 
I've heard about this and mm -hmm. I saw a trailer or something and I said, oh, I'm going to watch that. But I never did. So what's the, the premise of the show? Um, so it came out in 2020. So it was one of the last things that was made before uh, quarantine set in and everything was kind of ground to a halt. Um, but it's set in 2033 um, and humans can upload themselves into a virtual afterlife of their choosing. And um, the show focuses on a computer programmer named Nathan who dies prematurely in a car accident and his girlfriend uploads him against his will to uh, her family's like very fancy afterlife um, at this like resort spa type place called Lakeview. Oh, so you get uploaded after death. Yes. Can you go there in your life or it's just kind of an afterlife thing? Uh, so you can go there in your life. There are like VR suits and stuff. So you can visit dead people. You can visit your family. Whoa, so whoa. eventually your whole family will be living together wherever you choose to upload. And then um, also the living can go and rent one of these VR suits and go and spend time at Lakeview. This is kind of uh, gets into the same things as Star Trek, that kind of science and religion and what's the difference? Mm -hmm. Because in uh, DS9, you can physically travel to where these god aliens are, or some people get there through prayer. Oh. And it's kind of like, huh, so the cool. afterlife is a tangible, well, not maybe not tangible, but it's a, a thing, a provable thing in this world. Yes. Do religious people then be like, well, I wouldn't do that because I'm going to the real heaven. I don't need this fake heaven. So it's a bit of a like rich people thing there are options um and you can start paying for it like during your life to go um and then there are like r ranges of plans you can buy right so there's the people um they call them one gigs who have one gig of data for the entire month and once their data is done um, you're just grayed out and you just like sit on your bed until the next month's data comes through. Oh, interesting. So you can still be poor in the afterlife. Yeah. Oh man, this is, this is stressing me out already. Yeah. So, uh, you kind of get to see Nathan, um, come to terms with the fact that his girlfriend who is still alive, um, has like almost complete control over him because she's basically bankrolling his afterlife. So she can choose basically everything that he does or has access to. Um, and I, so I thought that was really interesting because he doesn't really have any control. And then when he does gain control, he realizes how good he has it because he ends up becoming a one gig person. This is a great premise. I it's like a, that a lot. It's super fun. Um, there's like customer service jobs for the living um, to be people's, um, they call them angels. And so you can call on your angel and they can like help you with stuff or buying things or explaining what the afterlife is. Um, and so he, uh, Nathan kind of becomes friends with his angel named Nora. And uh, it's really interesting to see the different kind of power dynamics in the show. It seems like there's also shades of the good place and Beetlejuice mm -hmm. in here a little bit too. Yeah, and you can, uh, like, people in the afterlife who are rich, because we're at a very rich um, afterlife location uh, in the show, and you can see people, uh, they can pick at what point in life they want to be. So if you, want, if you died at 95, but you want to be 30 forever, you can. So did you spend time thinking about it yourself, what you would do? Yeah, I did. So I don't have a great answer because I'm just hearing the premise now, but I'd like to hear, would you go to this given the opportunity? I think so. I, I don't know so. that I would. I kind of like the finality of death. Like I just need, I just want to rest. <laughs> Although if you're living like it's a like full a restful life, then maybe that's all right. It's like living at an all-inclusive resort in like rural Ontario, like cottage oh. country. Hmm. Hmm. But you have absolutely everything you could ever want. But can you, you can't go to other places. Uh, no, you can't. Oh, I don't know. I think I would definitely go for like a trial period mm -hmm. after death because like, what's the worst that could happen? And then you could always pull the plug? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I'm assuming you'd go with like the best package you could afford. Yeah. That's You're generally... not going to be a one gigger? No. No. That's like they show you what one gig actually gets you and it's something like 
10 minutes of conversation or something like it's not oh, very human much interaction yeah is mo- oh my god yeah this sounds this sounds like too worrisome to me i don't know <laughs> if i do it um yeah it's definitely something that would only be fun if you had all the money in the world to kind of play with right just like regular should, life exactly you it's wouldn't only have to fun worry if you have it. lots of money and yeah when you don't it's, it's not very fun yeah <laughs> exactly so you get to meet lots of people um at uh the afterlife place you get to meet people in the real world who are dealing with um this kind of go between of the afterlife which is like perfect and harmonious and amazing and just like their regular everyday lives because they're not rich they're just customer service people. Oh, see, now I'm just thinking of the last three and one future thing we've talked about, which world would I rather live in? Yeah. One where there are Megan type dolls. We're living in that kind of future. That doesn't really do too much for me unless you get one and it just, just does all your laundry, which would be nice. Mm-hmm. Or if we're in a Star Trek type world where Earth itself is relatively a uh, socialist utopia because... People don't work jobs unless they want to. Now mm-hmm. we've gotten to the point where it's just like, yeah, what can you do to make the world better? If you want to be a painter or make wine, that's your thing. But mm-hmm. maybe you're going to be an engineer. But then there's also the, at what cost does that come? Mm-hmm. Maybe, and maybe there's um, shape-shifting aliens. Yeah. That's a possibility too. Yeah. Or would I want to go to this world where like you could live in luxury forever but that's only if you've already made that money. And mm-hmm. does that just make you way more money driven in your regular life? Because mm-hmm. you're like, well, this is 70, 80 years. Mm-hmm. What does this count over uh, like hundreds, thousands of years of afterlife? Yeah. Do I just make money now? So, Or can you make money in the afterlife? I don't think so. Oh. Um. So eventually at some point, everyone's afterlife comes to an end because mm-hmm. your money runs out. Yeah. I think you have to have the money, like, ready to go. Yeah. Like, you have to be able to say, like, oh, yeah, I can have, like, a full afterlife forever <laughs> because I the put I- my million dollars up or, like, whatever it costs. The idea that I would have to save money for death, uh-huh. that stresses me out. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty stressful. You also get to see um, Nathan and his girlfriend. Uh, you get to see... How because one's alive and one's dead, Nathan's basically expected to like just like wait around for when she visits. Right. And she's. He's like a pet. Yeah, basically. And uh, Ingrid's out in the world and like has friends and a life and that kind of thing. And so that you get to see some of that kind of tension. Of, it just like, sounds like. Are you seeing like actual real life people on dates or are we like forever, forever? It sounds like a metaphor for having a rich friend when you're not. Yeah. (laughs) You just sit around and wait and like, well, all I can do is this. And if you grace me with some of that money, we can do the fun things. But I am just trying to make my own in this little gray room. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. And so this is an Amazon show, right? It is an Amazon show. Yeah. And there's two seasons of it. um, And it was renewed uh, for a third season. Oh, interesting. I thought it was all done. No, I'm quite excited about the third season. Any idea when that comes out? Um, No, there's no date so far, I believe. It's just going to happen. I guess when you're streaming, you don't have seasons on a schedule like like network TV does. And because of the pandemic, the first season came out in 2020 and the second season didn't come out until 2022 because there was, you know, a work stoppage. Um, So May 2022 was when it was renewed for a third season. So hopefully soon. Cool. Well, go check out Upload. Is that what it's called? I think I'm going to go watch it. Good. It sounds good. It's fun. It's a fun show. It's like light. It's not super heavy and dark unless you really start to spiral and think about the Which is clearly what's already happening. Yeah, you haven't even watched the show yet. You're already (laughs) like, this is so depressing. (laughs) Because on its surface, it sounds... uh, like perfect and utopian and then mm-hmm. you realize like oh no this is this sounds this is like the worst it. this is late stage <laughs> capitalism where you have to buy your eternity yeah exactly <laughs> gross all right well either way i'm still gonna go watch it excellent 
And our second sponsor of the episode is the Well Endowed podcast by the Edmonton Community Foundation. The podcast explores the impact of passionate people who are working to make Edmonton a strong, vibrant city to live in. The Edmonton Community Foundation helps people create endowment funds, and the podcast tells the story of how those endowments intersect with the community. You can find the Well Endowed podcast wherever you get your podcasts, or you can subscribe at thewellendowedpodcast.com. Okay, Andy, uh, what are we going to be watching for our big watch next week that is science fiction? Well, it is going to be a takeoff of our last watch, which was Megan. Mm -hmm. So you can listen to last week's episode because we're going to be dealing with similar themes of AI, of what is humanity, Mm -hmm. of should we even be doing this? Oh, Just because we can, should we? Mm, and the downsides to that and just the nature of what humanity is and we are going to be watching ex machina Mm -hmm. so ex machina is a 2014 science fiction film written and directed by alex garland and this was his directorial debut it stars domhnall gleason and oscar isaac and there's two smaller parts as well alicia vikander and sonoya muzuno But it's a small cast in general because this, despite its very grand ideas, is a rather small and intimate film in a lot of ways. Hmm. I'm surprised. I feel like sci-fi to me is like a lot of people for some reason. Yeah, because we think of, I don't know, like Independence Day and a big spaceship coming down Mm -hmm. and blowing up Earth or attempting to. But it doesn't need to be that. Just like uh, any genre, it can be so many different things. So... I think maybe we're doing a little bit of that in the last couple of weeks of saying, hey, all genres are for everyone. There's something in there for everybody. So the short pitch for this movie is there is a young programmer and he is selected to participate in some sort of experiment in artificial intelligence by coming and working with whatever this artificial intelligence is in a... um, wealthy reclusive genius guy's home he's going to come and see what he's been working on and that guy's played by oscar isaac and he invites him over and he says like yeah you're gonna sit here and uh, kind of see what i've done and i want your opinion on some things and you're just gonna come stay in my home for a couple of days and see what's going on and that's just the jumping off point and then we do get into a lot of those kind of um darker ideas so i think this is less of a fun action sci-fi and more of a thought-provoking not quite getting into horror elements but more into the thriller side of things so that's kind of the tone they're going for here and i actually haven't seen this movie since i saw it i think in theaters in 2014 but i did really enjoy it and it's one where i'm like that was a great movie, right? Wasn't it? <laughs> but I'm having trouble remembering a lot of specifics about it. Oh. I'm remembering a lot of themes and ideas and a lot of the atmospheric stuff, which I thought was all very good. It did get nominated for a few Oscars and I think won the visual effects Oscar for the 2014 season. Cool. And the creator of this movie is Alex Garland, who I think does a lot of really good work. He was actually a novelist first. And it's weird to go from being a novelist to directing sci-fi movies that win visual effects awards. Hmm. But he wrote things like um, like The Beach, that uh, Leonardo DiCaprio movie. Oh. He wrote, uh, because it was based on a novel. Right. And he wrote the novel, and then uh, it was subsequently turned into a movie. But then he started writing movies, and a lot of them, I think, were quite good. Like, he wrote uh, 28 Days Later, Sunshine, Never Let Me Go. And he was just a screenwriter and then started getting into direction. And as a director, Ex Machina was his first one. But then he also went on to do Annihilation, which I thought was quite good. I think a lot of people didn't like it, but I can't remember if they didn't like it for good reasons or if it was just one of those where like, hey, why is there four women on screen all the time? Now I'm angry. <laughs> oh. Because sometimes it is just that. But sometimes movies like that have legitimate reasons to not like them, like right. um, that Ghostbusters one. I think a lot of people were like, hey, there's four women on screen and I'm angry about that. And I was just like, you know, also the script wasn't great. Yeah, like we don't need to do everything with an all woman cast. But um, Annihilation, I thought, was quite good. And he also did a movie called Men, Hmm. 
which was just from last year. And I haven't seen that one, but I think it got nominated for a few Oscars and things as well. Hmm. So he does good work. Um, the leads in this movie, I think, are all really solid. This is more of a kind of actor showcase in a lot of ways. There's a lot of great performance work. And that's not always what we think of when we think of sci-fi. We don't think of quiet and tense mm -hmm. and very good acting. But I think that's what we get here. But then again, it's been almost 10 years since <laughs> I've seen it the one time. But I'm going to say it is still very good. You are doing kind of what I do of like, I saw this movie and I think I liked it. So let's hope we still like it. <laughs> And a good thing for a lot of people out there is that this is a relatively easy movie to find for free. Oh, nice. So if you do have Prime Video, you can watch it on there. It's also available on Tubi, that free app. Oh, yeah. So it'll have commercial breaks in it, but still, you can watch it for free. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also available on those two big library streaming apps oh, nice. in uh, Hoopla and Canopy. Nice. So you can watch Ex Machina all over the place. <laughs> and you can also probably just get a disc from your local library or what have you. But we will be watching. I own the Blu-ray, so I must have really liked it because I yeah. went down and bought it after watching it. Huh. So we'll well, be watching it on that. I look forward to seeing if you still like it next week. Yeah, me too. So go check out Ex Machina and we will be talking all about it next week. Awesome. Bye, everyone. Goodbye. I don't even care anymore, man. I'm just going to fold my arms. Fold my arms so hard? Yeah. <laughs> Fuck the world. Got my arms folded. I don't care if I don't look approachable. You know what? I also don't want to be approachable. Nobody wants. Nobody should be approachable twenty four seven. Stop approaching me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, everyone, just stop just, approaching me. If you could stop, if you could, that would be great. <laughs> that would be awesome. I don't want to be approached.